Today is different. Um, it is a special day here at New Salmas. We are providing over 400 families with their Thanksgiving meal, the Thanksgiving turkey, the Thanksgiving fixings, all the sides that go along with that. Um, we're providing that to 400 families. We've already sent a team of persons uh, to our senior buildings all throughout Baltimore City, Baltimore County. We actually were yesterday at our Samuel Coleridge Taylor partnering school, helping families at our partnering school. And we're even helping the Marion House. This is a homeless shelter for women and women and children. And we're providing Thanksgiving meals to all of these families throughout Baltimore City, throughout Baltimore County. This is all possible because of our vision of our pastor, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas Sr. And today is so special. Right now, we're even right behind me serving families Thanksgiving. The cars are here and our volunteers are here. We are thankful to each and every volunteer who's here. We're thankful for the people who are coming to be blessed by the meals. Good evening and welcome again to Lessons from the Cutting Room Floor. I am so delighted that you're taking the time tonight to come on for Bible study, Bible class, to understand the meaning of God's word in our lives and to see also what behaviors that means we must modify and what behaviors that mean we must take on. And I'm just so delighted that you're with us. Every week we come on sharing God's word. We've got some other things planned for this semester or this cycle of our Bible season and growing together in the word and then the word in life seeing the different things that are happening. And I'm inviting you to stay on our channel and check out some of the other things that we're presenting. Go to our Don't Quit series and hear the testimonies of some folks. Go to uh, Take Me to the Water and hear uh, the episode about a young man who's given his life to Christ. There's so much good that God is doing and I invite you to stay on and tell your friends to come on to the New Psalmist channel. Listen, we watch all these other channels on cable. We watch these channels on YouTube Plus. Watch the New Psalmist channel. Worship with us in our services. Learn with us in our classes. Share with us in our moments. And watch God change your life. That's right here on the channel you're on on YouTube. Come on over and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And we'll make sure that you always are aware when we're adding new content but I think it'll bless you. And I believe God will speak to you in a powerful way. There's so much happening, it's the Christmas season. And this Sunday, we kick off our Christmas season with a major worship at nine o'clock. In fact, our worship service is nine o'clock on Sunday morning. We invite you to share with us at nine o'clock on Sunday morning, either in the building, right here in Baltimore, Maryland, 6020 Marion Drive, or on one of our various outlets, YouTube, Facebook, or our New Psalmist website. But be in worship with us at nine, and then come back at three o'clock. Three o'clock, we celebrate communion and the opening of the Christmas season for us. Communion is a moment Jesus told us to share and told us to share it as a church family. I'm inviting you to be out for communion. Communion is a service where we remember his sacrifice not our mother's sacrifice, our father's sacrifice, or even our own sacrifices. It's what he sacrificed for us. We come in thinking about that. The worship is built around he died for us. And because he did, we have life. And he asked us to do this. So meet us here Sunday afternoon, three o'clock. We'll be in worship. The choirs will be singing. It's going to be a major time as we celebrate the birth of our Lord, the coming, the announcement of the birth of our Lord. So meet us here. Be with us on this coming Sunday. It's going to be a great time. And listen, let me share this. We are reaching out to blessed families. That's our aim and effort. We are really trying to be a blessing. Our, our mission statement as New Psalmist Church is this. We are brothers and sisters, ministering to brothers and sisters. And our mission is to make life better for someone else. And so what we've tackled and taken on this Christmas season is families adopting families. We've asked families of our church and families of our wider community, those of you who are sharing with us tonight, to adopt a family. You say, well, I don't know if I have the funds to adopt a family because we get the gifts 
We, get, we go out and we purchase all of their gifts. We will have food for them, everything. We want to provide Christmas for them. Their gifts are all listed. You can go to newsalmist.churchcenter.com and get all the information. A small, a, somebody says, well, I don't have that much money to do. I can barely do my own. Call some of your friends and come together as a group. Come together as a group. Pick a family, then go make the purchases. Every, all of you, put your monies together, then go make the purchases. Get the things together and then bring them to the church on this coming, on next Saturday, because we're going to be blessing those families the next week. I need you to really sign up. We want to be a blessing to about 500 families. And we're not doing it by the church raising money and a committee going out buying everything. No. We're asking individuals and families to take on the responsibility of helping another family personally. You will know on Christmas morning that someone else has a smile on their face because of your efforts. So go to newsalmist.churchcenter.com and sign up. Last but not least, last but not least, I'm so excited for my own son, um, one of the staff members here, the director of ministry here at New Psalmist, Reverend Joshua Thomas, who has been called to the St. John Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia. It's a great church down there, great people. And they're looking forward to him sharing as their pastor. And we are going to send him off in a sense on the third Sunday in December, right here. And we invite you to come and worship with us on that third Sunday morning. It's going to be a great time of fellowship together. And to send, bring, send him your notes, your cards. He's been serving with us for many a year. And now God has seen fit that he should start another journey. This is the season of new beginnings. And this is the new beginning that God had purposed for him at this time in his life. So I'm asking you <clears throat> to meet us on the third Sunday in December, 9 a.m., it's going to be a great time of worship as we salute one of our own, the director of ministry, Reverend Joshua Thomas. My wife and I are excited for him. We're happy, sad, but we're excited for him and for Candace, his wife, who serves right by his side, and baby Josh and Ava and Chandler, who will be making that journey to Gainesville, Georgia, to do the work of the ministry. So keep us in your prayers here at New Psalmist and keep him in your prayers at St. John Baptist Church. Well, let's get to the Word of God. The Word of God is coming from the 107th Division of the Psalms. The 107th Division of the Psalms. I think all of us find a great affinity for the Psalms. They do mean so much to us. The Psalm 107 is the beginning of what's called the fourth book the fourth book of the Psalms, or rather the fifth book of the Psalms, the fifth book of the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are, the way I like to say it is, they describe all of our human emotions and our human experiences, what we go through. But they also talk about an unmatched and unmeasured relationship we have with God and how that relationship churns and turns. Book one that starts with the first psalm. There are 150 psalms in the Bible in, these, in this collection. 150. And Psalm 150 is probably one of the most powerful singing psalms. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know, it, it speaks, it, it, it ends in a sense, the Psalter. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. That's how this fifth book ends fifth book of the Psalms. It ends as it opens with a sense of salutation to God. Book one, somebody said, well, it's five books of Psalms. Yes, five books. Psalm one through Psalm 41 is the first book, the first book. And often um, Bible teachers will say that these five books pattern themselves after the first five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we'll look a little bit at that at the, when we get down to this passage. But Psalm 1 through 41 would be considered book 1, book 1. And it deals with the God who stands beside us. 
the God who is with us. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, this is God with us. This is God with us. God being beside us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The message of book one is that God is very present help in time of trouble. He is with us. He is with us. God is our refuge and strength. That starts in, verse, in book two. God now is the God who stands beside us in book one. But now when we get to book two, which is Psalm 42 through 72, we deal with the God who is in a sense before us, making a way. God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, for there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of our God. He is in the midst of her and he shall help her right early. God is in front of us. God is before us. He is marching a path. And because he is before us, we can confess our sins before him. We can plead our case and he will wash away all of our sins. He will wash us whiter than snow. Each one of these books ends with a praise, with a hallelujah salutation to God. Blessed be the glorious, thy glorious name forever. Book three, book three, Psalm 73 through 89, talks about the God who is around us. The God who is around us. The God who marches with us through history the God who makes time for us and who is always working on our behalf. In, in book three, book three, we are challenged regularly to make sure that those coming after us know the faith that we possess and why we possess it. And book three ends with, blessed be the Lord forever. In each one of these cycles, as we deal with the, the who-ness of God, as we deal with the who-ness of God, each cycle ends with a hallelujah for an understanding of who God is. Now, book four starts with Psalm 90 and runs up to about Psalm 106. And it focuses on the God who is above us the God who is above us. Teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. He that abideth under the shadow of the Almighty, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High abideth under the shadow of the Almighty. I shall not fear the arrow by day or the, the affliction by night. I shall, I shall not worry about any of that. Why? Because God is above me. God is above me. Book one, he's beside me. Book one, he's right beside me. Book two, he's in front of me, before me. Book three, he's above, all around me. All around me. Everywhere I turn, he's there. Book four, he's above me. I look up to him. I look up to him. I know who he is. He is the great God. He is the great God. He is the God whose house I adore. He is the God who I praise every chance I get. Oh, let, let me just share one, one piece. One of the famous songs that are Psalms that all of us are very much familiar with. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us in that. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. This is the God. This is the God who is above me. He is the great I am. He is the great I am. And then we get to book five. And this is the God who walks among us who walks among us, who is 
not just around me, but not just beside me, not just above me, but this is the God who is among his people as a, <clears throat> as their Lord, their God, their friend, their father. He is among them in a unique and special way. He is not just, he is not just around them as God. He is among them as their God. Write that down. We're in the section where I know he is my God. Where I'm not just worshiping God, but I'm dealing with my God. My God. And book five opens with Psalm 107. And it ends with Psalm 150, this triumphant sound of praise that declares, let everything, that have breath, praise the Lord for who he is. Having come through, having marched through these various plateaus of understanding to get to the final place of saying, let everything that is within me bless his name, praise his name, praise him with the sound, with the flute, praise him with the cymbal and harp, praise him with the loud sounding cymbals, praise him with the organ. Let everything praise the Lord. Why? Because he is the God. He is the God who is among us. He is among us, not as God. And it foreshadows, it foreshadows Christmas. The God who is among us in Jesus Christ. The God who is among us in Jesus Christ. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. The Psalms open with five divisions. And the last one, sim almost connected in a sense, in a way, in a thought, with the last of the five books, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy opens with a rehearsing of the history. You know, this is all the stuff I couldn't preach on Sunday morning. You know, people were sitting there like this, oh. When's he gonna get to the passage? Deuteronomy opens with a reciting of what God has done how Israel has gotten to where they are, with Moses standing and declaring, and it's written as his fifth book, how God has brought Israel to where she is, how God has been among Israel. And so the first part of Psalm 107 opens up, or rather Psalm 107 opens up with a recanting of the history, a, a retelling of who God has been to the people who have returned from their struggles and their triumphs, or rather their struggles and their exile. It is an attempt to tell them or to tell the story of where they have been with God, how God has made a way for them. They have been through hell and high water, and now they have entered Canaan land, they have entered Canaan land. This is almost a psalm that goes with the journey that Israel has had. How Israel has been, how Israel has come through so much to get to where she is. And he opens by saying, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. He starts off, book five starts off with this acclamation of a mature saint, oh, give thanks to the Lord, because he is good. And then he begins to rehearse what they have been through. Let the redeemed of the Lord, let those rescued by God say so, whom he has rescued, redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Who has rescued, redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted to, in them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. Sunday's sermon was entitled, I've Got a Reason to Praise the Lord. 
why I praise the Lord. And I think there comes a moment in all of our journey where unashamedly we have to look at why we praise God. He is the God who is beside us. He is the God who is among us. <clears throat> he is the God who is above us. He is the God who walks by our side. He is the God who is all around us. There comes a moment in our journey when we have to understand the value, power, and presence of praise. There is, the Psalms are given to us by the people who live the other books of the Bible. Now granted, the Psalms do rehearse human history and experience, but they also declare that in the living of our lives, in the daily push and pull of our existence, there comes a moment, there is a moment that cannot be stopped. Every book of these five books of the Psalms, every one that gives us a different plateau of experiencing God, of, of the God who is beside us, of the God who is before us, of the God who is around us, of the God who is above us, of the God who is among us, ends with a ringing refrain of hallelujah and praise to the Lord. That means the psalmist discovered a praise even while he was recording and testifying to other kinds of experiences in his life. Even while he was recording and talking about all the different things he was experiencing, he still found and rediscovered, and get this, reasserted that praise in his life. I got a reason to praise God. The praise is the outward expression of the hallelujah of the relationship he shares with God. It is this relationship that guides him through, stops him in the midst of whatever trouble he's going through and makes him realize something marvelously wonderful that even in the midst of all of his ups and downs, the God who is beside him is there. The God who is around him is there. The God who is above, among him is there. The God who is beside, uh, be around him is there. God is with him every step and above him. He realizes in every, how do I say it, maturing moment. He realizes in every segment of his living, in his 20s, his 30s, his 40s, his 50s, his 60s, he realizes as he passes through each juncture that no matter what he faces, there's a countermanding, a counterbalancing effect going on inside of him. And that counterbalancing effect is the presence of the God who makes himself real in our lives, who makes himself real. Oh my God. And as a result of it, praise comes forth. He utters forth praise. And the truth is, he can tell anybody going and coming why he praises the Lord, why he stops, why he's a 21-year-old and praises God, why in the midst of the contradictions of life, he praises God. I love the Dickens passage that defines that contradiction of life, that yin and yang that we experience, that good, the bad, and even the ugly. It was the best of times, the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was an age of foolishness. It was an epoch of belief. It was an epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. These juxtaposing experiences that we live through and are living through right now Oh, yes, we are. We're living through these, these juxtapositioned 
experiences. One day we're up, the next day we're down. The next day we expect to be up and we're down. The yin and the yang. And yet, and yet, the psalm writer says, and still, my hope is a homeward bound, heavenly bound. I'm still pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm on low ground now, but I still have this praise in my heart. The praise is what people hear, what bubbles out. It is the sound that comes out of my soul that I can't stop because of what's happening in my soul. <clears throat> it, is the, it is the exuberance that shoots out my soul, my soul cannot find words for it. It cannot find words, but so my feelings just express themselves with all they have to offer, the sound, the shout, the scream, the echo of a previous song, the reciting of a previous verse, because something has altered. And I've started to realize that God has got us living through a season where he's telling us, we discover your praise. Don't we discover a song, a shout, a dance, but rediscover that something that's happening inside of you that gives birth to praise. See, a lot of folk are buying praise off the shelf, getting it off of a radio station or listening to it off of YouTube or some track. That's not the praise I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the praise you go and get. I'm talking about the praise that gets you. I'm talking about the praise that you create. Not, not a song that you sing, but what goes on inside of you because that caused you to sing it. And that, and that is awakened when you sing it. It's not the song. It's what's happening in you. I started wondering, what is it? Why does the psalmist say, I have a reason to praise the Lord? I, I have a reason to shout. I have a reason to, to say all of this. Why is this? And, and, and it's clear, as he said, to be honest, I'm blown away with this because I'm looking at all we are living through right now. All that we are living, they may not certify elections now in certain states or certain counties, and certain counties are hoping if they don't certify it in the county, they won't be able to certify it in the state. And if they can't certify it in the state, certain people who won the election can't take seats. I mean, how crazy way out are we getting? We've got, we've got uh, businesses seeming to um, look like they're gonna implode and they become a staple in our American life. We've got people being killed every day. We've got murders and stuff going, I mean, just going haywire. We've got sicknesses and deaths on the rise. And yet the psalmist says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. In fact, he is not just good. He is great. He is great. He is, he is worthy to be praised. Oh, give thanks to the Lord because he is good. He is good to us. He, he manifests his kindness to us. He, he shows us his love. He is all that and some. He is good. His moral being is good. The God that we serve is the God who is, oh, give thanks unto the Lord because he is not capricious. He doesn't look beyond us. He is not out for himself. He cares about us and he takes good care of us somebody write in the chat god is good put a comma but i tell you he's also great he is the great i am there is no one who compares to him no one who compares to him in the midst of everything that's happening the psalmist says i'm still looking up and i'm praising god you know, we gather on Sunday morning and we come to church and we fill up the seats and we can sing and we can shout. And, and we get this, we, we, we come to Bible class and other moments like this, not just with a praise on our lips, 
But we come, or rather a prayer on our lips, but we come with a praise in our spirit. We are in this world, but we're also in another world where God is God and we are his children. And the more that truth saturates us and the more we marinate in it, the more we began to see that praise being birthed inside of us. We grabbed the psalmist's words because somehow, guess what? We bounce back. We get back. We jump back and we hit back. Our cup runs over in our spirit and we shout to the highest. There's something in our faith walk that holds us and keeps us even in the rough times of life and makes us say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. I've lived long enough to wait through some moments because I know I'm going to get to this statement. For he is good. There's a message in this text for us. There's a message in this text that God is good and God is great. But the text is a reminder that when things are looking rough, and this is this is why we praise him. And this is why I say you can't get it off the shelf on a song. You can't just go to your usual playlist. You have to go inside yourself to where your praise is born. And the reason I praise God, the reason the psalmist is given, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. You know why I praise God and why I think you praise him too. And I know why the psalmist praised him. The psalmist praised him because God has a way of making sure that because he is the God who is beside you, because he is the God who is around you, because he is the God who is above you, because he is the God who is among you, because he is the God who is with you, he has a way of making you and I realize, I am not going to let you stay in any defeated place. I'm not going to let you stay broken down. The children of Israel have made their way for 40 years through the wilderness. 40 years represents the period of time of wrestling. Somebody said, well, I don't want to have to wait 40 years. Well, you may not. It's, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a way of showing us on a national level what happens on an individual level that we have to work our way through. But joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but Joy comes in the morning and I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Why? Because he won't let me go into a funk and stay there. He'll send somebody by to lift me up. I may not want to hear him, but they'll say what I need to hear. He'll, he'll have me watch something on television that speaks directly to me. He will speak to me directly. He will not let me Stay, go there. And if I go, he won't let me stay. How many of you have ever worked your way into a funk? You, you know, you were down and you couldn't get down enough, so you had to work harder at it. You had to come up with five more reasons why things were terrible, why this wasn't going to work, why that wasn't going to happen. You had to build a funk for yourself. But God won't let you go there. He won't let you go there. I mean, you're trying to be, but he won't let you. And so you've had to work to go there. But even when you try to work hard to go there, he won't let you stay. He comes and gets you and pulls you back out. I, I love Jesus's prayer, his high priestly prayer, that when he taught his disciples how to pray, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. D don't let me go there. But if I get there, deliver me. Lead me not into temptation. Don't, don't, don't let me go there. But if I get there, deliver me from evil. That, that Psalm says, that's why I praise the Lord. Because God doesn't let me stay there. I get in the funk and he finds a way to get me out every time. I wasn't coming to church. And I came to church. Didn't plan to be in no Bible class tonight. And this is being said, God ain't going to let you stay in that funk. God's not going to let you live in that downward position, in that despair. Why? Because he is the God who is beside you. Why? Because he is the God who is before you. Why? Because he is the God who is around you. Why? Because he is the God who is above you. Why? Because he is the God who is among you. He's coming in there to get, he's not just around. He's coming in there to get you. He's coming in there to get you. The Bible is filled with stories of God coming after his own, coming to get his people, coming to straighten them out, coming to lift them up. And, that, and, and when he comes to get us, when he speaks to us and makes himself known to us, it is what I like to call a mystical moment with God, a revelatory moment with God. I, I remember one of the great revelatory scriptures God gave me in a moment when he came to get me when I was in a funk. I was in a funk. I was feeling bad. My health was bad. This was, oh, God. I don't even know. My, our children, Joy and Walter may have been born, but I'm not sure. And I was just down and I was defeated in my spirit. But God won't let me stay there. God had me open the Bible. And let me, I, I, I just sat and I did this. I just opened my Bible. And I remember saying these words, I'm going to read this Bible wherever my eyes fall. I'm going to open the Bible and God, I just need you to speak to me through your word and say a word to me that's going to lift my spirit. Because I was down. I mean, I was, I was in a funk. I was in a blue funk. And I, and I opened the Bible, just like I'm doing now, just let it fall open. And I said, God, whatever I read, it's going to be the word. And I went down and said, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. I was preparing for surgery. I was preparing for surgery. And I was, I was much younger. And so I didn't have... I didn't have the faith I would one day leap into. I didn't have it. And so I was concerned that this might be the end. This was it. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, how to handle this. I was in a funk, a blue funk. And I said, I'm just going to open the Bible and wherever it falls, that's what I'm going to read. And my eye went straight to this line. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. I can't tell you what that did for me. I cannot begin to put in words what started growing in my soul at that moment. But it grew, as Jesus would say, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100 fold. It became a forest of God's divine love and mercy and grace growing inside of me. It became the wonderland of my inner experience. It became my excursion retreat resort place to visit because God had burst forth light. Somebody talked about how did God create the heavens and the earth in seven days and all other than in one day and then everything else in seven days. You have never had, have you ever had God burst something in you in a moment? In a moment, God created a whole new world inside of me that uttered forth the verbal and expressive praise that other folks saw and heard. They, they heard and saw the praise. They were not privileged to walk in or see the garden, the resort, the hallelujah hotel that God had built inside of my crumbling reality and reshaped my reality 
based on who he is. Oh, I hope somebody got that. God won't let you go there. God won't let you stay there. God won't let you live there. I will praise him. Why, why will I praise him? The psalmist is sharing this historical moment. But the backdrop for it is why can people talk like this? Why can you at the family dinner talk about God? Why, why can you not stop talking about God when you're out with your friends? Why do you not hold your peace? Why do you say, I got to say this? Why are you like the rocks? Why are you saying if these hold their peace, if I hold my peace, the rocks are going to cry out? Why? Because God has built something so marvelously wonderful inside of you with the revelation of who he is to you. I'm telling you, I opened the Bible. I was in a funk. And I said, God, wherever it opens, I'm going to believe that's you speaking to me. That was my leap into faith, my leap to faith. I didn't read verse 1, verse 2. I didn't read verse 18 or 19. I didn't read verse 13 or 14. My eyes fell straight on verse 17 because that was the guiding, gripping, governing God putting me where he wanted me to be, that a new reality could be born in me that others would understand had happened because of the praise they heard coming out of my mouth and out of my life. I shall not die. Remember, I'm thinking about dying, but live and declare the works of the Lord. <whistles> Just thinking about it makes me want to shout. Just thinking about it makes me feel like God is doing something even in this moment. He will not let us go there. And even if we go there, he's there with us. The eternal God is my refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. When he built that inside of me, he built that inside of me. I realized I always had a hiding place. You are my hiding place. You are my refuge. In the time of trouble, he will hide me. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Then will my head be lifted up round about my enemies. I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Wait again, I say, on the Lord. We begin to start realizing God is creating something in us and doing marvelous work. But there's a, there's, a second, there's a second reason the psalmist is dropping, it's encroached in this, why he praises the Lord, why, why the people of Israel praise the Lord, why those who gather praise the Lord, why Sunday morning is a praise service. There's a second reason. And it's simply this. Let, let, let me go back and read the beginning of the psalm again. Let me read it one more time. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. He said, you know why I praise him like I do, and I, I praise him all the time. Write this down. Write it in the chat. Write it in your notebook. Put it somewhere that you can pull on whenever you feel yourself slipping. Because you can't huh, keep his past mercies out of your head. I know for myself, I can't keep his past mercies out of my head. God has been merciful to us. How many of us know we shouldn't even be here? We have done enough to be considered disqualified for everything. But God has still put his favor upon our lives and kept us and blessed us. 
He, and the psalmist says, his mercy endures forever. Lord, listen, listen to how he dresses it up in the early strophe of this psalm. He says, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. His hung, they were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them, and he led them forth by the right way, and that they might go to a city of habitation. And then he goes on to say, for he satisfies their longing soul and fills their hungry soul with goodness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Hmm. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in their afflictions and in irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned and condemned the counsel of the Most High. And therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there were none to help. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and out of the shadow of death and break their hands and sun, their bands and sunder. All that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Wait a minute. For he has broken the gates of the brass, of brass and cuts the bars of iron and sunder. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquity are afflicted. Their souls abhorreth all manner of meat. And they draw near unto the gates of death. And they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saves them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. My God. The psalmist says, we praise God as a people. We praise him as a people. Because, somebody write this down. Because God keeps us in a perpetual state of remembering. A perpetual. I can't go far or long without remembering something God has done for me. How he rescued me from something, delivered me from something, changed my darkness into morning, my sadness into gladness. His mercies are everlasting. No, no, no. The psalmist says, we, we recite it, but his mercies are everlasting. They last forever. They're always there. They always show up regardless of how rank and raunchy we've been. He still makes the sun shine on us. He still wakes us up with the finger of his divine love and bids our golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wondrous acts, for his goodness to the children of men. I can't get what God has done for me. Can you get it out of your mind? how good he's been, how faithful he's been, how many doors he's opened. There's a song that, that our choir said, he's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back over my life, his goodness and his mercy I see. Oh, I, there have been times I've had questions and even failed to believe but he's been faithful, faithful to me. His mercies are everlasting. I got to praise God because I know I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But yet God has showered us with it. We live in a perpetual state of remembering. The, and the intent is not for us to see how bad we've been but to underscore how good God is. And out, of, and out of that, I dwell in this new place of reality he has birthed in me. And out of that new place comes praise. Now, one room God built was when I saw the scripture, I shall not die, but live and declare thy works, O God. But God's been building different resorts and retreats in my soul. 
different places that have stood out that he brought me out. When he wouldn't let me stay there, he wouldn't let me go there. He wouldn't let me be bound there. That showed me the reality of his presence lifted me up beyond who I was, took me in a sense out of myself to see myself as he sees me. Another place birthed. I got to praise him because I have these different rooms in my life, in my spirit to go into, to think about the God who is good. I used to hear Bishop Brown saying, he may still say it, God is good all the time and all the time god is good sometimes i pick which retreat place i will go to where i will sit with the god who built new space and is very present my very present help in the time of trouble his mercies are everlasting how much have we done that should have left us destroyed, but instead it has left us alive. It has left us alive. Our, Mary Gaskew says in her song, I still have my praise. I still have my praise. There, there's a last thing. This is book five, patterned after Deuteronomy, showing us the history of what God has done and who God has been for his people, but also affirming that he is not only, that God is beside us, God is above us. Oh my God, God is around us. God is among us. God is everywhere we need him to be. And because of that, because we know he's beside us, He's above us. He's around us. Because we know all of that and because we can feel and sense all of that and because we know he's before us, in front of us, because we are anchored in the reality that he is among us. He walks with us, not just in the world, but with us. This is why. This is why we praise him. And this is why I praise him. Because God knows. He always knows just what we need. And he provides. He knows just what we need and provides. I may think I need something else. But when I look back, I see he knows exactly what I need. And he provides. He provides just what we need. When the children of Israel languishing in Egypt, Pharaoh in charge of their tomorrows, God sent one lone soldier, Moses, with his brother Aaron to back him up. And that was just what Israel needed. Israel needed to know that their God was God and that there are no other gods before him. And one man crippled an imperial power and brought it to its knees. One man, God knows exactly what we need and he provides it. He knows exactly what we need. And he knew we needed Jesus. We needed the living embodiment of himself. Y'all missed that. Moses and the prophets are great. David and, and Amos and all the crew, Isaiah are all wonderful. Saul, Samuel, everybody's fine. But we needed the living embodiment of God himself to walk among us, to help flesh understand how to live as sons of spirit. Somebody write that down. To let flesh understand how to live as sons of spirit, sons and daughters of spirit. And so we needed Jesus. And what did God do? He saw our need and he provided. He sent his son so that we would know that even though flesh be killed, Job say, though skin worms eat up my body, yet shall I trust in him. Though flesh and blood fade away, that which is spirit and from where spirit came will return to spirit. He sent his son in the form of flesh so that we could see 
how spirit lives in flesh. And even though this world could not afford him a home, we knew, we, we knew God sent him to us because we needed somebody to save us from ourselves, save us from the darkness of the wicked one. And God sent Jesus who took all of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, took all the evil that man could put on one person and took it all to the cross and said, this is what evil has for intent for every person. This is how evil views you. And this is what evil will do to you. And I'm going to show you what God does to evil's best effort. I will rise from the dead. So that even though evil may seem to come after you and seem to sometimes capture you, let me show you what God will do. He will not even let you stay there. He will raise you from the dead. He will fill your life. Now, I will fill your life with my presence and you will find me if you truly seek me. You will find me if you truly seek me. That's what that's why I praise him, because I sought the Lord and he heard my prayer. I sought the Lord and he heard my prayer. Pull my feet out the mire and clay and set me on a rock to stay. Put a song in my heart and gave me a God to glorify. That's what the psalmist is realizing. I praise God because he won't let me go there. And if I get there, he won't let me stay there. He will deliver me. I praise God because I can't get his mercies out of my head. I live in a perpetual state of remembering. We praise God because God knows just what we need and he provides. And he has provided. He has provided his son to walk in human form and to walk in flesh, to be in flesh, for flesh. To come as a man in all ways as a person. To take on the enormity of being humanity but to show us the absolute eternality of spirit and to show us that spirituality can occupy flesh and that the children of men can become the children of God. And that when earth, when earth has done its worst and when this earthly body is destroyed, that which is birthed in us shall live forever. Why do I praise him? Because to be honest, who wouldn't praise a God like this. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I hope you got something out of today's lesson. I hope it spoke to you and helped you realize why you praise God. He won't let you go there. And if you do, he won't let you stay. Because his mercies are forever cropping up in your mind and memory. You live in a perpetual state of remembrance. You can't get away from who he's been to you. And third, you've lived long enough to know he knows what you need, even though it's not what you think you need and he will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He is Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is with me. Listen, we're getting ready to lift our offerings now. I hope somebody's been blessed by the word. If you've been blessed, write in the chat something that may have spoken to you tonight. Write in that chat what word spoke to you. What word, what part of the lesson really spoke to you tonight and gave you something to think about. Maybe it was that you can't stay there. Maybe it was these mercies that are everlasting. Maybe it is he knows what you need. But put it in the chat. Put it in the chat and let others begin to see what you're thinking and see what you're saying because this will bless all of us. We're getting our offerings together. Let's prepare to give our gifts of love and faith. We use Givelify or Pushpay. And if you're on YouTube, you can go to the little three dots and you'll see more. And you can hit that more and it'll tell you how to give your offerings there. Same way on Facebook, you can give on Facebook. And if you're on the New Psalmist website, you can use our website to give. You can even mail your gifts to the church, 6020 Marion Drive. I encourage you to support this work that we're doing because God is trying to use us to make life better. Somebody said, well, what are you doing? What we're doing, we're doing right now. Trying to not just speak to your mind, but trying to plant in your heart because the real issues of life grow in the heart. And I believe God is growing something in you right now. Our aim and effort, listen, you know what we see? We're intentionally leading as many persons as we possibly can 
into a dynamic, engaging, and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what we are all about. That is the mission and message of New Psalmist Baptist Church. And we do it by teaching, preaching. We do it by programs and activities. We do it by classes and workshops. We do it by fellowship, by being a community. We do it by thinking and praying and singing and shouting. We use whatever it can, whatever we can, to intentionally lead as many persons as we possibly can into a dynamic, engaging, and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Because New Psalmist is a church where connections are made. Connections to God, connections to each other, and connections to the world. God bless you tonight. Don't forget, third Sunday is our service for, with Reverend Joshua as he takes his leave to go to Gainesville, Georgia. Um, Christmas Day, we will be in worship right here. And on, with helping families and everyone who wants to adopt a family, Go to newsalmist.churchcenter.com. Newsalmist.churchcenter.com. Sign up for a family. Get your friends to sign up with you. Be a group and do it together. We want as many folk as possible who are sharing with us tonight to be adopting families. Ask somebody on the chat, join in with you to be a part of adopting families. We want to take 500, and I'm asking you to help us do that job. God bless you tonight. Keep us in your prayers. Keep First Lady in your prayers. She's doing so much better. And I want to thank you for all the prayers and all of the cards and gifts that have been coming our way. Thank you so very, very much. See you in our, at those who are members, I'll see you at our annual review on Monday night for all of our members, just to talk about what we did this year. God bless you. Take care now. Know that I love you and I look forward to seeing you in worship with us Sunday. God bless you. Have a good one.